Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Nirak Bundia. Um, today, I'll be talking about patellar instability uh, in pediatric and adolescent patients. Um, this is my uh, Twitter handle, and uh, I'm the Chief of Pediatric Orthopedics at UCSF and the Director of Pediatric Sports Medicine. So the goals of this talk will be the following. Number one, we're going to talk a lot about the epidemiology of patellar instability. Uh, number two, we'll talk about anatomy. Then we'll give us over some history and physical exam, um, some imaging as well as treatment, and we'll throw in some physical therapy as well, too, in terms of what we're doing when treating these patients. Now, the important thing to understand is that in general for patellar instability, there are 5.8 cases per 100,000 in the general population, but it's much more common in the pediatric population. Generally, there are 43 cases per 100,000 in the pediatric population, so it's a complaint that that I will see very frequently in my clinic. It's also the second most common cause of hemarthrosis in the pediatric population. And usually age 15 is the peak incidence. And typically, particularly I see this in my clinic as well too, females between the ages of 10 and 17 are at the highest risk. Now, the first important thing to understand is we need to break down the anatomy um, of the area as well too, to understand what are the various things you need to do in terms of treat this, particularly in a pediatric patient. So the main areas you're looking at is number one, the patella, the trochlea, and it's important to understand really the morphology of the patella and the morphology of the trochlea. That's where a lot of the anatomy comes from, and also understanding what are the forces that are exerted on the patella to make it sublux out laterally or dislocate out laterally, what may be bony and what may be soft tissue. Um, so when you're looking at the anatomy of the patella, it's important to think of, okay, well, what can be basically causing this? You've got bony issues in terms of the patellar morphology. You've got the trochlea. You've got um, where the patellar tendon is basically inserting, where the quad tendon is um, you know, pulling, um, also femoral antiversion, overall bony alignment of the leg. There are all these various factors you need to consider. So the first thing to understand is when you're thinking of anatomy, what actually is keeping the patella actually in the joint? So in terms of a bone standpoint, you think of overall lower extremity alignment and you think of the trochlea. Then you think of the muscles, which are the extensor mechanism. And you have to think about the ligaments, which is the medial patellofemoral ligament. You also have to think about lateral patellar tilt as well too. So once again, understanding this anatomy is extremely important and toward understanding what is actually causing the kneecap to go out rather than which a lot of us who do sports medicine uh, think a lot of is MPFL, MPFL, MPFL. There are various other factors that are necessary. So the first thing to understand is what's the function of the patella. So the primary function of the patella is knee extension and the patella increases the leverage that the tendon can exert on the femur by increasing the angle at which it acts. And there are tremendous amount of forces across the patella. With walking, it's half your body weight. Go to squatting, it can be up to 7.5 times your body weight. So there's a lot of forces going across this joint. Now, the, one of the important things you need to do, particularly when you're looking up at pediatric patients, you need to first look to see if individuals have ligamentous laxity, because that can be a completely different story. In those individuals, they're going to have loose kneecaps. You need to basically try physical therapy until they fail it, because any kind of ligament reconstruction, any kind of bony re reconstruction is typically going to fail in this population because it's an issue with their collagen as opposed to an issue in terms of their anatomy or a mechanism of injury that may have occurred. So this is a case presentation to kind of get um, stir some interest. It's a 15-year-old male. First time this dislocation ever happened. The key point is that when an individual comes in your clinic, you want to differentiate out first, is this the first time dislocator or recurrent dislocator or someone who's chronically been subluxing and had a larger instability event? So in terms of history, these are generally non-contact twisting injuries. Typically what they'll say is that something popped. 10% um, is direct trauma. It's extremely rare. Typically it's non-contact mechanisms. You want to look for family history. A lot of these individuals, particularly in the pediatric population will say, I have a family member who actually had this problem. Um, and that's going to make you that there's likely something like trochlear dysplasia, it'll be TTTG, various things that would make you think that this is the reason why um, this is running this family. Most of these will spontaneously reduce. Um, typically they'll reduce an extension. Now, in physical exam in the acute setting, they're going to have an effusion. They may have a block to range of motion, um, and they're going to be tender over the medial patellar facet and the lateral femoral condyle. And you can understand why this happens. When the patella dislocates out laterally, the lateral femoral condyle is what gets the impact, and the medial patellar facet is what impacts as well, too. So this is a great example of how the patella femoral joint will be impacted when the kneecap dislocates. So before imaging, you really want to think why. I think that I tell my residents and fellows, let's break down what may actually be causing this before immediately going to imaging. Because once you get imaging, it can be hard to interpret if you don't have a pre-existing notion of what may actually be causing it based on your physical exam. So when you get an imaging and you've thought of those factors, you want to think, okay, what are things that I have to deal with now? Obviously, if there's a large fracture, the patella is not reduced, or they're loose bodies. This is particularly for a first-time dislocator. So radiographs, you want to get AP lateral notch, either a merchant or sunrise view. 
Um, and you know, there's some controversy if you get MRI after first dislocation, since a lot of my practice are active patients who are playing sports, typically a little bit younger, who are adolescents opposed to nine, 10, 11 year olds. I typically will get an MRI for first time traumatic patellar dislocator, particularly since I'm looking out for large chondral loose bodies. I'm also looking for other ligament injuries. A lot of times people will say their patellar sublux are dislocated and they actually have an ACL tear or an MCL tear or meniscus injury. But most importantly, you wanna look for loose bodies because that's really what drives treatment. High level athletes, a little bit more questionable as well too. Will you potentially do intervention on someone who is dislocated for the first time? I think the main indicator and driver of getting an MRI is number one, look for large chondral loose bodies. Number two, look for other uh, pathology. The initial treatment in the emergency room setting, you, once you've ruled out other injuries, I typically will neomobilize them for a short period of time until their extensor mechanism is back. We'll do crutches. And then if you are a primary care physician, you want to refer to ortho within less than a week. But then generally after a week, I will get them out of that neomobilizer, get them moving, and begin some sort of exercise and begin my treatment protocol. Now, for a first-time dislocator, typically, if there's an osteochondral injury, such as a large cartilage piece, or something else that needs to be taken care of, I'll generally do arthroscopy and then either fix the piece or if it's a large non-viable loose body, take that out. If there's not an osteochondral injury, for the vast majority of my first time patellar dislocators, I will send them to physical therapy. The important thing to note, there have been large studies that have looked at first time dislocators, um, basically looking at surgical interventions as a whole versus uh, non-surgical interventions. There's really no difference in terms of first time patellar dislocators. This is another study that was done that looked at non-op versus medial repair. The recurrent rates were the same um, and the positive family history was a risk factor. There are some now more new studies that are talking about if you do go and intervene for a loose body and do an MPFL repair, that perhaps an MPFL reconstruction, if you're gonna intervene, may be better in terms of actually treating these patients. Uh, in my practice, I find that MPFL repair is a good kind of tidying over procedure that can give them some degree of stability, particularly if they're skeletally mature um, and need a larger bony procedure in the future, it can give them some degree of stability. Or if there is good ligamentous tissue and you're going in there anyway, it allows the opportunity to reattach it and not necessarily jump to a big MPFL reconstruction as a longer return to play or return to sport criteria um, than someone who may, uh, who, you know, may simply undergo repair or loose body removal. So the goals of non-operative physical therapy management, I think it's important for surgeons to understand this is to reduce pain, swelling, motion, get good quad control, get soft tissue flexibility, normalize their gait, control the knee, restore neuromuscular control and consider bracing and then return to sport. There are multiple goals. So I think it's important to understand it because a lot of times we'll see these patients some of the physical therapy and then they say, when can we return to sport? And you say, oh, we'll just talk to the physical therapist about it. So I think it's important to understand that. The number one priority is reducing swelling. A knee joint effusion will actually cause quadriceps muscle inhibition. So the ways you can do that, you can do um, the typical rice dice compression elevation, electrical stimulation, manual therapy, taping, compression. There are various different ways um, that that can be achieved. Reducing pain also um, can also help with quadriceps inhibition. Um, if you, you, we look at surgical data and we find that people's quads will typically become weaker if they're having pain after surgery. So in general, inhibiting pain, regardless of modality which you use is really key for developing that quadriceps um, to be a lot stronger. Then you wanna restore range of motion. Um, early knee range of motion is I think is really key. We would usually in the past many, many years ago, we'd immobilize these people for a long period of time. But I do think in general for the muscular control, the dynamic control, which is really important, it's important to um, restore range of motion. Um, and then I think you have a short period of immobilization uh, for the pain and swelling to go subside, then you begin range of motion. If you begin range of motion when they're pain and swollen, then you can typically dislocate out. So it's a balance. So you have to restore overall quad, muscle control. And it's important to note that you can't preferentially activate and strengthen just the VMO. A biofeedback training and taping may improve VMO onset timing, but you can't just isolate just that muscle. So you have to focus on quad strength in the whole. Um, and there are different arcs of motion that you can utilize to reduce stress on the patellofemoral joint. Then you want to improve soft tissue flexibility, mobility, um, things you may look at as people are getting their mobility back. Um, do they have excessive lateral pressure syndrome? Um, or do they have a laterally tilted patella? Do they have decreased glide? Do they have pain over the medial patellofemoral ligament? Is their IT band and lateral retinaculum tight? And really what you're doing is getting generalized flexibility of the quads, the hamstrings, the gastrox, um, and the IT band and the tensor fascia lata. Um, and then you want to normalize their gait. And typically patients will have a flexed knee gait pattern. And you want to reduce their joint swelling, restore their quad control, and normalize soft tissue flexibility. Um, and you want to consider retrograde cone walking as an exercise. And you want to control the knee through the hip. And, and the ways that you can help to control the knee is not necessarily just concentrating on the patellofemoral joint, but also on the, the core in the hip. So you really want to have an activated gluteus medius and a gluteus maximus that puts your leg in a position such that um, it can actually have good control um, and that you won't dislocate your joint up through those non-contact mechanisms. I always say that if you're weak, 
up in the core, you're going to place your knee in a lower external position that's actually going to increase your risk of patellofemoral dislocation. Um, and in general, we talk about the trunk a lot. What the trunk is, is really a multi-layer structure that moves the spine in all planes of motion. It activates um, and counterbalances kind of abnormal motions. And really the goal is to control the center of mass of the body and the ankle as well too, because you have an ankle that is unstable can lead to patellofemoral instability as well too. And your final goal is really, really restoring neuromuscular control. It doesn't matter how much strength you have, how much flexibility you have, if you can't dynamically utilize it. So you can do things like cutting and pivoting, plyometric, landing, et cetera. And there was a study that looked at the three activities that they were perceived the greatest factors for patellar dislocation. They were cutting maneuvers, change of direction maneuvers, and running on uneven ground. And in terms of bracing, I, you know, I think it's always a, a you know kind of a double-edged sword with bracing. Obviously, knee mobilizer you want to limit in terms of how long you use it. Um, some of these patellar stabilizers will give stability in the early phases as you're getting back to activity. They do have some psychological benefits. They can reduce pain. They give you some degree of proprioceptive feedback and protection and some neuromuscular patterning, but in general, we try to get patients out of these braces because if they're depending on the brace to give them their degree of patellar stability, they may actually benefit from surgical intervention. So in terms of generalized return to sport criteria, you want to have no pain, instability, or fusion. You want them to have full range of motion, at least 90% limb uh, symmetry. Um, you want excellent dynamic stability. You have a low risk on movement when you're doing some sort of motion testing, screening, and they have to be psychologically ready, which I think is not talked about enough. Um, if you do have a motion analysis lab or have something available where you can actually do sports performance, um, there are various different things they can utilize to basically um, look at that. I think the key thing is to understand that you have a standard series of tests. If you do do it, whether it be using your iPhone or whether it be doing it in physical therapy, that basically then help to quantify when these athletes are ready to return to play. So let's go to a different presentation now. We have a 16-year-old who now has had this patellar dislocation and it's happened five different times. So what are you looking for in terms of the history in a recurrent dislocator as opposed to a first-time dislocator? You want to think, what's the mechanism of injury? Was it another high-energy mechanism or was it low energy? How much physical therapy did they do before? Were they compliant with their home exercise program? Did they do bracing? And is it really dislocating or is it subluxing, which I think is important? And do they need an ED reduction or was it a spontaneous reduction? So in terms of the physical exam, you really want to think about what's keeping this patella the cause to repetitively dislocate. And once again, it's anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. You need to really critically look at it. So you want to get plain radiographs and you want to get an MRI in these situations as well too. And the treatment really depends on what are their activity goals? Have they failed conservative treatment? Do they have any arthritic changes? What area is anatomically affected and how skeletally mature they are? So in terms of the treatment, it can be like drinking from a fire hose. So the first thing you're going to look at is femoral anaversion, which means they have more hip internal rotation than external rotation. And what can happen when the femur is internally rotated, the patella can engage with the trochlea and it will slide out laterally. And the treatment for this, if they have excessive femoral anaversion, and for me, that typically means um, greater than 25 degrees of anaversion or asymmetric side-to-side -side differences, then sometimes you can do a femoral osteotomy. The second thing you want to look for is see if they have genu valgum. And if they have valgus, that once again will create a laterally directed force that will cause the patella to dislocate out. The treatment for that is guided growth or osteotomy. You can see over here, a valgus deformity will cause a laterally directed force on the quadriceps mechanism and cause a, a vector laterally to cause the patella to come out. Patella apprehension or a J sign, um, that basically indicates the patella is going out laterally. Um, from zero to 30 degrees, it's the MPFL that really gives stability. And after that's the trochlea and the greater, that's the notch. So you wanna look for that J sign. Typically when patients have a J sign, that indicates to me that they may need a um, tibial tubercle transfer. Then you want to look at the medial patellofemoral ligament, which really is that tether from zero to 30. I think it's important when you're assessing patellar stability, that's the last thing you look at. You want to look for all the bony changes first, and then after that, look at the soft tissues. And typically for MPFL pathology, you'll do a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction. Trochlear dysplasia is a much more harder problem to deal with. Um, that's something that a lot of patellar dislocators will have. I think it's something important to notice. I think there are two main considerations for that. Number one is that trochlear trocleoplasties, which is creating a trochlea, are gaining some degree of acceptance, but they're large procedures. And I really only utilize that in the revision setting. Um, you look for, depend on your other bony work. The other thing that's important to understand is that when you are doing patellar stability procedures, you can understand that you don't create medial instability in a, a dysplastic patient. So these are patients where we may say, you know what, I'm not gonna do necessarily do a lateral release because I'm worried about patellar, medial patellar subluxation. I'm not going to do an aggressive a tubercle transfer to make sure that they're not dislocating out because they don't have that normal trochlear glue to, to uh, basically give them um, some degree of stability. Um, so typically with trochlear patients with trochlear dysplasia have a normal TTTG and other bony issues, they'll basically be treated with MPFL reconstruction. And then if they have a lateralized tubercle as well too, that can be measured as a Q angle on physical exam. 
or tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance on MRI. Um, typically, we use somewhere above 15 to 20 as an indicator of them needing uh, intervention. It's also important to understand that they may also have patella alta as well too. It may need a straight tubercle distillation. So that's something you don't want to miss as well too uh, when treating uh, patients who have patellar instability. And here's a great picture of patella alta. Same sort of thing. If the patella is very high riding, it won't engage in the trochlea. Um, and that's something that you need to treat with a tubercle distillation. You may combine that if there's a, a tibial tubercle trochlear groove issue as well too. And then, um, and once again, just like with tubercle transfers, you can only do this really when the patient is done growing in terms of doing bony work. And finally, a tight lateral inoculum. Once again, that's more for patellar tilt. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily do it for isolated treatment for medial, um, sorry, a lateral dislocation. This is about causing a tilt, which then causes the patella to slide downhill, not a factor that necessarily pulls directly laterally. If they have normal uh, increased patellar tilt, you can do it in a lateral release, particularly that's done arthroscopically. So if patients do get an MPFL reconstruction, this is a little bit different than a tubercle transfer, but MPFL reconstruction is still done commonly. Um, you typically will keep um, toe touch weight bearing for the first week, then generally let them begin weight bearing as tolerated. Uh, once they regain their quad control, you generally will slowly increase their range of motion. The key is maintaining their full knee extension and you wanna get uh, their, uh, their calf moving. You increase range of motion 10 to 20 degrees um, every week for a goal of 90 degrees by the end of six weeks. Um, you wanna get them, as I mentioned, weight bearing is tolerated. Um, you wanna mobilize the patella, but avoid lateral slides. You wanna do lower extremity and core strengthening, uh, dynamic balance exercises and mobilize that soft tissue. Um, at six weeks, typically you can progress to full range of motion. You can discontinue crutches and brace. You have to have a good single leg squat. You wanna really emphasize that return to run criteria. Um, and you're safe to begin squatting and lunging past 90 degrees flexion at eight weeks post-op. And then there's a return to run program, and this varies based on the surgery, but in general, um, when you can do those various criteria, you need to begin walking, then you need to be able to do a little bit more leap steps, and then you can do straight ahead running, which starts with um, jog walking, followed by more walking, and then eventually um, doing more agility work. Um, and this typically occurs with the running program, 12 to 16 weeks post-op. Um, then you begin a jump program, and then you begin some balance and proprioception exercises. And the jump program is really that transition into doing agility work and return to sports. And it can vary from physical therapy to physical therapy location. And then 16 to 24 weeks post-op, um, you really begin the return to sport criteria. And typically for me at six months, um, if you have minimal um, quadriceps deficit and uh, whatever screen you use in terms of motion testing, if you do use that, they have to be low risk so that you don't cause another patella instability event. And in general, uh, in terms of things you want to meet, no pain, instability, fusion, full range of motion, 90% limb sim strength symmetry, excellent balance, low risk on movement scores, and psychological readiness. So in summary, uh, patellar dislocations are a common injury in the pediatric population. You want to differentiate out a first-time dislocator for, from a recurrent dislocator. Most first-time dislocators get physical therapy. Recurrent dislocators, you want to think what anatomical factors um, are causing dislocation, um, as well as um, think about what you see on the MRI. Uh, femoral anniversion and valgus are frequently missed. The MPFL is a main constraint from zero to 30 and the trochlea from 30 to 70. The position of the tubercle tubercle can lead to need for treatment. It can be too lateral or too high, or excuse me, too, and then you need distillation and you examine for a tight lateral retinaculum. Uh, thank you. Once again, that was a lot about patellar instability. I also want to thank Suzanne Becker, who is one of our physical therapists here um, at UCSF um, for contributing a lot of the physical therapy slides in the past. Um, and thank you once again. Hopefully this gives you a better sense of how to work up pediatric patellar dislocation. Thank you.